Let's turn together to the Gospel of John, chapter 16. And we'll begin our reading today in verse 16. Let's pray together. Your words are a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. In you we see light. We praise you for revealing yourself to us, Father, for revealing your Son, Yeshua. Open our hearts, open our eyes, open our ears. And then stir our wills to respond to all that we see and hear and experience from you in Yeshua's name. Amen. Yeshua and his Talmudim, his eleven, are on the final night of Yeshua's physical life on earth. They have they have gone from the upper room where they celebrated the Seder and they have probably begun walking across the Kidron Valley to the Garden of the Olive Press, Gethsemane. And shortly Yeshua will be kneeling, falling on his face in prayer. And he's been sharing last words with his Talmudim, his disciples. And it seems as we have moved through these chapters, through chapter 13, and then especially 14 and 15, and here in 16, it's, it's thick, it's dense. We see the glory of God revealed in these chapters, in Yeshua's words. And Yeshua is revealing wonderful things to these followers and to us. These truths, these realities are for us as well as followers of Yeshua. He continues to help these disciples as they prepare to face his departure. And in verse 16 of John 16, he says to them, a little while, and you will not see me. And again, a little while, you will see me, because I go to the Father. Then some of his disciples said among themselves, what is this that he says to us? A little while, and you will not see me. And again, a little while, and you will see me, and because I go to the Father. Yeshua has been saying this in one way or another throughout his ministry. He's been preparing them for this time because he has come for this very reason. He has come that he might give his life as a ransom for many. He has come to pay our sin debt. He has come to give his life as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And as through the Gospel of John, we have seen him say, my hour has not yet come, he has begun to say, my hour is now here. My time is here. And now he is saying not only that, that a little while and you will not see me because of that experience that I will go through, but then a little while and you will see me because I go to the Father. Yeshua has come from the Father, and he is returning to the Father with absolute confidence, with absolute peace of mind, with great joy, even in the midst of these difficult times. Yeshua knows he is headed to his Father, and he is with his Father, and his Father is with him right now. And the disciples are puzzled about this. They were puzzled about it when he said this to the religious leaders. And now they're wondering about it. And they 
They said, they said this. What is this? In verse 18. They said, therefore, what is this that he says a little while? We do not know what he is saying. That's common experience for us, is it not? That often God says to us things that we just don't understand. And I think it's helpful for us here to see how Yeshua responds. In verse 19, even as the Father knows, Yeshua knows. Now Yeshua knew that they desired to ask him, and he said to them, Are you inquiring among yourselves about what I said? A little while, and you will not see me, and again a little while, and you will see me? How, how helpful it is for you and I to learn the lesson of the importance of bringing everything to our Father, telling Him all that is going on in our minds. He knows it already. There is nothing to hide. Although we sometimes do things we want to hide, it is, the, it is so much like when my sons were younger, they would close their eyes and think, think I couldn't see them. And we are that way as well. We think that God can't see what's going on. Or we, we don't know what's going on. Maybe we're afraid for some reason, embarrassed, ashamed, scared, uh, prideful. Who knows the, the many motivations that stir in our hearts. But Yeshua is inviting them and saying to them, I know what's going on in your hearts. I know the questions you have. Don't just talk to each other about it. Come on, talk to me. And then, in his love and care before we even ask, he responds and helps us and begins to answer our questions, begins to reach into those areas where we haven't discussed matters with him. And so Yeshua says to them, is that what you're asking about? Is that what you're concerned about? Well, in verse 20, Yeshua says, most assuredly, truly, truly, verily, verily, I affirm solemnly to you, this is the truth, I say to you that you will weep and you will lament, but the world will rejoice. And you will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn into joy. Now we have considered this, this part that sorrow has in our life a little bit before. And I want to clarify that in a moment. But I want us to see that Yeshua, throughout this part of John 16, throughout this ending part, before he goes to prayer, Yeshua's focus is on joy. Isn't that amazing? Yeshua knows the agony of the cross, of giving his life on the tree, of being a curse for us. He knows what's coming. And his love is so great for these, his followers, for us who would follow as well, that he is concerned about us experiencing fullness of joy. In the midst of the darkest times, he is speaking of joy. Now this, this matter of sorrow I suggested the, that when we came across it earlier in this text, that Yeshua had said to the effect that, that I'm, I'm making this, that, that I'm, I'm leaving, and it is to your advantage that I go away, and because I've said I'm leaving, you're sorrowful. And I suggested that, it's, that perhaps the circumstance and the, the leaving is not what makes us sorrowful. It's rather that we don't understand what Yeshua is doing because it was to their advantage that he goes away. But I want to come back and say that sorrow is our common experience and it is okay for us to experience that and for us to walk through that because there are different sources of sorrow. Yeshua this often has been called a man of sorrows. 
And so there's something that's okay about experiencing sorrow. I, th I think of the, the experience of, of Shaul as he is praying for his, his nation, for the Jewish people. And he has, he has said that I have sorrow in my heart for, the, for my brethren, my countrymen according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom pertains the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the service of God, the promises of whom are the fathers and from whom according to, fle to the flesh Messiah came, that I have sorrow because I have continual grief in my heart because they don't yet know Messiah. They haven't come to trust Him. So there's, a, there's a, an appropriate sorrow there. And there's a sorrow that comes when you and I are convicted of sin. There's a healthy sorrow that we would be grieved over our sin. And not worldly sorrow. Worldly sorrow leads, leads to death, Shaul would write. But sorrow that is genuine conviction and, and reaches to the very core of our being and really touches us, that sorrow brings about repentance, real healthy, good change. And Shaul would talk about Epaphroditus, who is ministering with him in Philippi, or in, in writing to the Philippians. He, the Philippians had sent Epaphroditus, one of their own, and he was ministering with Shaul, but Epaphroditus had gotten sick. And Shaul would write that for indeed he was sick almost unto death, but God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but also on me, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. There's things that happen in this world, fallen world that it is. People getting sick and are hurt, and there brings sorrow to us an appropriate sorrow. And there's a, a sorrow that comes to us when God is pruning us and training us and disciplining us. It seems difficult and sometimes it, it kind of hurts. It's painful. There's a sorrow that comes with that. And there's a, a sorrow that comes because of being wrongfully treated because of facing injustice because our stand of our stand for Yeshua. But in the midst of all of that, because God is in our lives, there is this wonder and this mystery. Shaul writes about it. He says that you and I can be as sorrowful yet always rejoicing. That we are as poor, yet we make many rich. We can be as having nothing, and yet we possess everything in our great God. Mysteries of the kingdom. Yeshua is talking about these things that happen to us. Sorrow that comes into our lives for many reasons. But the thing that we know for certain that trumps them all is that because Yeshua is in our life, the sorrow is going to lead ultimately to His working and bringing about joy. We are headed for joy. Now, Yeshua has, has talked about this with His... He said, I'm leaving a little while. I'm leaving. You're going to weep and you're going to lament because you think all is lost, perhaps it's rooted in the fact that you had a wrong view of Messiah and who He is and what He would do, but there's going to be the genuine mourning because I have left and the leaving is going to be terrible to look at. In the moment it will be awful. But then Yeshua continues in verse, verse 21 and He says, now this is my leaving and your sorrow, it's, it's like a woman in childbirth. A woman, when she is in labor, has sorrow because her hour has come. My grandfather, on my dad's side, 
he, in the mystery and glory of God, he would be working in the field and God would actually give him labor pains so he knew he needed to get back to his wife and help her. And that was a mystery, amazing to me. Um, my dad came from a family of 14. So they went through that quite frequently. I'm not sure that every time God did that. I'm thankful that God did not give me labor pains when our three sons were born. But I, I, I know it's different for every woman who's a mother. I once talked about this at a ministry retreat, university ministry retreat I was on. And I was asking if anyone uh, in, the, in the gathering had uh, gone through labor, and one woman had. And I thought, well, did you experience pain? And she said, no, I experienced no pain at all. I had an epidural. And so, you know, okay. Every woman's experience of labor is different. But generally speaking, what, what Yeshua is saying, a woman who has bearing a child comes to the place of labor and that labor is very intense and that labor can be painful and in that moment it can seem the most challenging thing of all and yet what happens as things go according to the way God designed as soon as she has given birth to the child Eventually, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being, a baby, has been born into the world. Now, do you see what Yeshua has done? Yeshua has framed sorrow and his departure. He has framed it in one of the most positive and glorious experiences that can be known on this planet. Childbirth is something you go through to get to the glory. The glory of a child. And that's what Yeshua is saying. Walking with him, the sorrow in this moment in particular, he's talking about going to the cross, him leaving, that, that what's coming is joy that's going to make you forget all about the agony the anguish, the sorrow that's going to conquer the sorrow. There's going to be joy. Joy. This, I heard one speaker one time say that this joy is like deep down soul satisfaction. It's happiness that is, is not happenstance. It's happiness rooted in the character and the presence of God. It transcends circumstance. It transcends whether we feel good, whether we've had a good night's rest, whether we have nice circumstances or not. This is joy, well-being, shalom. God's blessing in our life because of his very presence, his work. Now Yeshua continues in verse 22. He says, therefore, you now have sorrow, but I will see you again and your heart will rejoice and your joy no one will take from you. What a glory. Yeshua is about to go through something that will make it impossible for us to lose our joy. We may, of course, run through times, have sorrow when it, the circumstance feels so difficult and challenging and painful. But ultimately in Him, no one can take away our joy. Because our joy is rooted in Him, not in our circumstances, not in ourselves. It is rooted in Him and the relationship we have with Him by faith and what He will accomplish, what He is, has accomplished. He was yet to accomplish it when He said it at this moment. It is finished for us. We see, we look back. And in that day, verse 23, you will ask me nothing. Most assuredly, I say to you, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. 
Until now, you have asked nothing in my name. Ask, and you will receive that your joy may be full. Now, what is he doing here? He's saying that as I go through this painful experience of leaving, and you experience the lament and the grief and the sorrow, and the world rejoices, it's going to flip around, and the world can't touch the joy that you're going to have forever and ever, and no one can take that joy away. And by my going through this, by me going through this, through the cross, and then seeing you again, the resurrection from the dead, the door is opened for you to have complete, total, free, absolute access to the Father in my name. And this access to the Father to pray, to converse with God about all things. What is my purpose in that? That your joy may be full. Now we've heard this earlier. Yeshua has talked about prayer throughout these passages. Throughout this time he's had with the Talmudim this night. And he's mentioned in, in chapter 14 that we can ask anything in his name and he'll do it so that the Son may bring glory to the Father. And he's talked about this experience he's going through is going to be the glorifying of the Father, and the Son will be glorified through that as well. And he's talked about other places, about how we glorify God. In, in chapter 15, he ties in the Word living in us, and us abiding in Him, we can ask whatever we wish and he'll give it to us. And then he talks about that the Father is glorified when we bear much fruit. So he ties prayer in with glory to the Father in both answering of our prayers and in being fruitful in life and in ministry, in character, and in what we do in him. And so we see that blending this all together that the glory of the Father and our joy are intimately connected. And that really, when you and I live for the honor of Yeshua, for the honor of God, when we live for His glory, that He would be seen as beautiful and glorious and wonderful and worthy, when when we live for that, and as we talk to God about that, He brings us joy that fills right up to the very brim and overflows. And so He's talked about joy through this experience, and joy coming out of sorrow, and He's talked about joy coming in prayer. And then He, he continues in verse 25, he says, these things I have spoken to you in figurative language, but the time is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figurative language, but I will tell you plainly about the Father. And certainly there are things that Yeshua has said that have made us kind of puzzled. Dark things, sometimes a little cryptic. But he's saying that he's going to speak plainly. And in verse 26, in that day, you will ask in my name, and I do not say to you that I will ask the Father for you, for the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I came forth from God. I came forth from the Father and have come into the world. Again, I leave the world and go to the Father. There are things that these followers of Yeshua could not understand that were not clear because Yeshua had not yet given his life on the cross and not yet been raised from the dead. I think Yeshua is saying that as I, as I go through this, as I give my life for the salvation of the world, as I give my life to pay for the sins of the world, and as the Father vindicates me and raises me from the dead, then things are going to become increasingly clear. This is going to help bring clarity. 
This will bring, help bring understanding about the Father and about me. And you see that I go through all of this and it, it, it's interesting that, that you and I can approach God, the Father, in the name of Yeshua. And it's not that Yeshua is trying to arm wrestle the Father into loving us and wanting us to talk to Him. And that somehow we, we have to trust in Yeshua to, to change the Father's mind. No, the Father Himself loves us. And the whole reason Yeshua came was because the Father loves us. And the Father wanted to break down every barrier that we might be in intimate love relationship with Him. And He's doing that through His Messiah, through His only begotten Son, Yeshua. And it becomes clearer and clearer as we look at what Yeshua goes through on the execution stake and then being raised from the dead. Well, his disciples, they're hearing all of this and the swirl of all that they've been hearing. And this last part, perhaps it seemed more clear to them than other things. And yet, still, they're not all that clear. But they think they are. In verse 21, his disciples said to him, See, now you are speaking plainly and using no figure of speech. Now we are sure that you know all things and have no need that anyone should question you. By this we believe that you came from God. Yeshua answered them, Do you now believe? Indeed the hour is coming, yes, has now come, that you will be scattered each to his own, and will leave me alone. Maybe you don't understand quite as much as you think you do. And certainly they don't. But Yeshua is still gracious. And he's still helping them. He's still walking with them through this time. Still loving them. And saying, well, there's, you're going to be scattered. You're going to leave me all alone. But I know, I know all about that. I know that. But the Father, yet I am not alone because the Father is with me. Even, even though you're, you think you know it, you think you got it, you think you see clearly, you're still going to scatter and leave me. And yet I'm still relying on the Father because the Father's never going to leave me. I'm going to go through this with the Father. I'm never going to be alone. And then he brings in his, his final statement to them before he goes to prayer. And it's another word of encouragement for joy. After all of this, he's, he's loving to the very end, to the uttermost. And he says this wonderful promise that's precious to all of us. These things, verse 33, these things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have shalom. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Be of good cheer. Ah, oh, what a great word. Tribulation. That word is the same word that is used back in verse 21. She has given birth to a child. She no longer remembers the tribulation. Same word. Anguish. Being pressured. Being distressed. Being in straits. You, know, you and I know all about that, don't we? Some of us more than others that we have experienced the pressures, the being in tight spots, the being in difficulties, walking with the Lord, and struggling with all that life has to offer. Tribulation because this world has fallen, and you and I are on the path with the way, the truth, and the life. Tribulation 
And yet, in the midst of it, Yeshua says, be of good cheer. Now he said this before, through, through his ministry, Yeshua said this from time to time. And I, I think of a couple of, of occasions. Do you remember when the friends brought their paralyzed friend to Yeshua? And Yeshua looked at the man paralyzed and he said to him, Son, be of good cheer because your sins are forgiven. Yeshua saw in his heart the faith that he had and declared good cheer to him because of forgiveness. And then you remember the religious leader, Jairus, bringing his daughter to Yeshua and or wanting Yeshua to come to his daughter who was sick and near death. And Yeshua went with him and on the way, there was a woman who had an issue of blood. She had been bleeding and getting worse for, for 12 years. And in her mind, in her heart, God had so worked. And she thought, if I just touch the hem of Yeshua's garment, I'll be made well. And so she was in that crowd. She was unclean, but she took the risk. And in that crowd, ebbing and flowing back and forth, she reached out and touched Yeshua's garment. Yeshua knew that power had gone out from him and he turned around and he was looking around and when he saw her, what did he say? Be of good cheer. Why? Because daughter, it wasn't magic. It was your faith in me. Well placed, rightly placed faith that has brought your healing. Be of good cheer. And then Yeshua had been praying on the, the mountainside after he had fed the multitudes and his disciples had he'd set off on the boat on the, on the Canaret of Lake, Lake Galilee. And in, in the night, or actually early morning, Yeshua had come walking on the water and they looked at him and they were scared. They thought they saw a ghost. They were totally afraid. And what did Yeshua say? Be of good cheer, because it is I. I am here. It is really me. What gracious, powerful, wonderful words that our Savior Yeshua speaks to us. The world is going to bring a lot of trouble. That's just the way it is. And Charles will say, you know, as we follow Yeshua in this world, as followers of Yeshua, as disciples, said, we will enter the kingdom of God through many tribulations, troubles, anguish. That's part of it for this time we have on earth. But the reality, the greater reality, is the joy that comes because our Savior says to us, be of good cheer. And why can he say that? Because what he is about to accomplish, I have overcome the world. I am victor. Victory. Anytime you see a pair of runners that has that little check mark, Nike, that's the Greek word that's used here for overcome. Nikeo. I have overcome the world. So next time you see that, think Yeshua the victor, good cheer. That is what he has accomplished for us. That is what he is headed for. He's going through the depths for these, for us, that in the midst of the trials and challenges of this life, you and I could know joy because he has overcome and I couldn't help but think to Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah chapter 53. That glorious text that we are so familiar with. Speaking of the suffering servant. Picturing Yeshua. After he has given his life, what happens? Verse 10. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. 
He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. So even though he goes through death itself, death does not hold him. He conquers death. He prolongs his days. The pleasure of the Lord prospers in his hands. Verse 11, he shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. By knowledge of him, by his knowledge or by knowledge of him, my righteous servant Yeshua shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life, his soul, unto death, and was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Because Yeshua is victor, he shares with us the spoils of his victory, which means joy, good cheer, good things coming, conquering this world, and leading us to glory. Thanks be to God for this glorious Savior, Yeshua.